Hey, we have so much to celebrate today. You guys packed over 10,000 meals today in like two hours. And so can we give all the red shirts a big round of applause today? Woo! We have had so much fun serving this summer in all the projects across the city. And uh, it's still not done. We're getting ready to fill the bus in a couple weeks. And so get ready to bring in supplies as we pack the bus for uh, our local schools in the area. Uh, but we're just so excited. Can we also celebrate everyone who got baptized today? It's incredible. Well, hey, let's do this. If you could stand one more time. And uh, we want to just start off with pray, prayer because uh, that's where our help comes from. But can we do this before we pray? If, you, if God touched you today in some way during worship, the presence of God has been here all morning long. And if God touched you this morning, can we, can we just take five seconds and just go crazy for Jesus. Can we do that? Come on. Woo! Yeah! Thank you, God. Woo! Let us never get tired of thanking God for moving. This is a house of miracles. Amen. And I'm so glad that you chose to be here today, either in person or online. Let's go ahead and lift our hands one more time. God, thank you for your presence. God, we thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for drawing us here today so that we could meet you. And so, Father God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to lift you up and to exalt you. And this morning now, we turn our heart towards your word. God, would you speak to us? As we just sing, God, you still speak today. And so, God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do today. And God, we just take a moment, God, again, when everything is said and done, God, we pray that you would be exalted, you would be glorified today. And every single person here today, the sound of my voice and watching online, God, that they would be helped, they'd be encouraged, that they would leave inspired to be more like you today. And God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, help me welcome our online campus as well. Woo! Well, you guys can go ahead and be seated. We are so glad that you guys are here. My name's Tom Fox. I'm the executive pastor here. And uh, I got exciting news. Pastor Tim is back next week. And uh, I can tell you right now, he is coming back fired up. So you guys better get ready. You better be inviting people. Uh, the, la the rest of this summer and this fall is just going to be incredible. And uh, I've heard, I've met so many new people today, uh, people that have been bringing their friends and neighbors. And so we're just, man, we're believing for God to continue to do great things. We've seen so many people come to Christ over the last several months and so many baptisms. I think we have already 50 people signed up for baptism already next month. And so if you have made a decision, it's not too late. I, I think it would be cool if we just spent the whole service baptizing people. I don't know about you guys. Wouldn't that be fun? Well... It's going to be good. So please, can we show Pastor Tim some love? He might be watching. Pastor Tim, we love you. Can't wait for you to be back. Well, I also have some really exciting news for you guys as well this morning. Uh, we are 54 days away from college football. I know some of you guys are like not excited about it, but anybody excited about that? Anybody excited? Amen, amen. Uh, hockey is done, basketball is almost over, and football is almost back. It's good. And uh, that reminded me of a story, actually, on New Year's Day, 1929, uh, Georgia Tech and UCLA fought it out at the Rose Bowl in 1929. And uh, it was right before the end of the first half, and uh, there was a fumble, and a young man from UCLA, his name was Roy Riggles, he picked up the fumble, and in his confusion... He ran the opposite direction for 65 yards. And luckily, one, another teammate by the name of Benny Lauren from UCLA, he was able to track down his own teammate and tackle him before he scored for the other team. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad, right? And so you can imagine Roy went into the locker room at halftime and, and uh, because right after that happened, they had to kick the, and then uh, Georgia Tech blocked the, blocked the punt, scored a safety, and that ended up being the two points that they needed uh, for victory. But Roy went into the uh, halftime, and you could just imagine, he was so 
just rejected, dejected. His hands, you know, were covering his eyes, and he was crying his eyes out. And his coach, Nibs Price, which is a cool coach name, Nibs Price, he looked at the team, and he didn't really know what to say, but he said this right before they were getting ready to, to go back out on the field. He said, guys, the same team that started the first half is going to start the second. And the team got up, and they went out on the field, except for Roy. He stayed in the locker room, and one of the, the coach went over to him. He said, Roy, didn't you hear me? The same team that started the first half is going to start the second. And Roy said, coach, I've embarrassed myself. I've embarrassed our university. I've embarrassed you. There is no way I'm going back out there in front of all those fans. That was the most embarrassing thing ever. And, of course, Coach Nib said, Roy, you got to get up and you got to go back out there. The second half still has to be played. And so he went out there, and, of course, Roy, he played the, one of the best second halves of his life. And uh, I love this story because Nibs Price gave Roy Riggles a second chance. And the reality is that if we could all just kind of get real for just a second, how many of us, at some point in life, you've ran in the wrong direction? <laughs> Come on, be honest, be honest. Like, we've all had those, those times in our life where we were running the wrong way. And hopefully you didn't drive the wrong way, but we've all ran in a, in a, in a direction that is away from God at times in our life. And God knows it, right? But the message is still the same. Don't give up and get back in the game. Don't give up and get back in the game. Like, that's the message. And I don't know about you, but I have just been... It lately, it seems like the last six months to this last year, I've just been reminded over and over and over, never give up. Never give up on people. Never give up on fighting for people. Never give up on loving people. And never give up on kindness. Right? Come on. Pastor Tim, he kicked this series off about five weeks ago with this whole thought that we need to show the world that God is loving and kind by being loving and kind. And Christians especially, we should be the greatest examples of love and kindness. And so I just want to encourage us, never give up. Never give up on love, especially today. Our world needs God's love more than it ever has. And God wants to use us. And so today I want to take a look for the next few moments at how we as the church, how we as believers, as Christians, we can become more like Jesus in the way we see and how we engage those who are far from God and far from the church, those folks that we are called to reach. And so the title of my message today is just simply this, God's kind of love. God's kind of love. How many of you guys need some God's kind of love? Yeah, me too. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, my sister, she was like 10 years older than me. And uh, she was just, you know, a different era than I was. But she, I remember her babysitting me, and she would chase me around the house. And she loved the Beatles. She loved the Beatles. And she would chase me around the house singing, all you need is love. You guys remember that song? Okay, we're not talking about that kind of love. I'm pretty sure my sister was under the influence uh, when she was doing that. <laughs> But we're talking about God's kind of love. And with that in mind today, there's been some recent research that's been done by the Barna Group uh, through their Barna City Initiative that shows the church, in addition to some of the uh, very much documented challenges the church is facing today, might have an emerging self-awareness issue. And the self-awareness gap is basically how non-Christians see the church versus those who attend the church see it. And it's also a generational gap. And essentially the gap is this. The younger you are, the more unchurched you are, the more you don't see the church in a favorable way. And of course, the older you are, the more churched you are, the more favorably you see the church. Common sense, right? I mean, we could probably say that about every generation. But this is where self-awareness comes in. Because oftentimes when there is a problem, we can't address it until we know about it. And the problem is this, only 21% of non-Christian people have a positive perception of the local church. And part of that reason is because they think the church and Christians aren't very 
loving and kind. And so we've done this whole series this summer with this big idea that we got to show the world God is loving and kind by being loving and kind. We have learned the how. If you haven't, if you've missed some of the series, I encourage you to go back, check out the archives. We've talked about the how. We've talked about the what. We've talked about the why. My friend, Pastor Dave Murphy, wasn't he awesome? He came and encouraged us to live with eternity in mind. Man, what an encouragement. And then last week, Pastor Jordan, he did an incredible job. One of the greatest ways that we can serve people is to listen. And it's so powerful. But our, the right response, and especially hearing this, I, I immediately kind of was like, well, that's messed up. Why do they feel that way? The church is great. And our response shouldn't be getting mad at those people who might not see the value or the potential of the church that you and I see. I'm afraid, though, if I could just be honest with you, that the church has become a little bit domesticated, a little weak. But I got to tell you something this morning. God's called us to a life of power and adventure. He's called us outside of these four walls to reach the people that he loves. And so I don't know about you, but I'm not really, I don't, I don't want a domesticated religion. I'd much rather have an awakened spirit where I know that better together, when we're together, we can absolutely change the world. I believe that. I mean, call me silly, but I think we still have the ability to change the world. But it's going to require some things on our part. It might require a little bit of repentance, maybe some humility, maybe some reconciliation. But ultimately, the cure for the problem that I just talked about is for us to be more of what we're authentically made to be, to be loving, compassionate, kind, generous, gracious, curious, like God has called us to be those things. But most importantly, he's called us to live out an ethic of love. Because I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Jesus is very much for people. Like he is still fighting for people. He's still healing people. He's still in the business of repairing people. Like God is still moving, amen? amen. And here at Meadowbrook, we're, we're more committed that, to that than ever. We believe we want to see people move from where they are to where God wants them to be, no matter where that is on the spectrum. And we believe every single person matters to God. And so our story today takes us to a place to, I believe, is going to help us discover what God's love kind of looks like and how it feels and what it look, feels like and looks like. And it will help us discover how we're to show others his love. And the setting is at the tail end of Paul's third missionary journey. And uh, he had just traveled back from Philippi. He's on his way back to Jerusalem to take the church, the gift there. And he spends a week in Troas, and we pick up the story in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, which was Sunday, we gathered with the local believers, just like we are today, to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. I love Paul. I think, I, I want to give it a shot. You guys in? Let's go till midnight. Just kidding, just kidding. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, we'll call him Eudy for short, he was sitting on a windowsill and he became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. I just want you to know, I'm watching you. If you fall asleep today, I'll have an usher come get, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that. Paul went down. He bent over him. He took him into his arms and he said, don't worry, he's alive. Then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn. And then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Now, I love this story because uh, there's so much going on in this story. And one of the things that we'll kind of unpack just real quick is we know Luke, he's the author. He's also a medical doctor. And he plainly gives us an eyewitness to this incident and plainly states that Eutychus had fell from the window 
and he was dead. I mean, it's clear. And the fall from the third story was just too much for this young man. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I just immediately thought about who was the guy that brought this to Paul's attention? I mean, he's sitting in the room next to Yudi. Yudi falls asleep, falls out the window, and the guy's like, um, Paul, uh, hey, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Yudi, he gone. <laughs> like, like, what would that have been like, right? Like, to be there and to experience and see that and to interrupt Paul, who was preaching till midnight. And the truth, if you kind of look in this story, we know that they had gathered together just like we're gathered together today. And there is something powerful when we come together and we lift up his name and we get into his word and we corporately then begin to get into community. And whether that's a small group or serving on the dream team, there's something that happens that's just powerful when we do that and we lean in and not away. And now I just happen to wonder, like if Eutychus would have been maybe, I don't know, out in the out outside parking camels, or if he would have been an usher or a greeter, maybe if he would have been on the worship team or serving in kids ministry. Like, I just wonder if he would have been somehow involved in the service instead of being marginal to it, if he would have fell asleep and if he would have fall out the window. But one of the things that I can't get my mind off of though, is the fact that somebody let him fall asleep. Somebody let him fall asleep. Somebody allowed him to fall out the window. And we know what the truth is, but I think what love says is that everyone needs someone. Everyone needs someone. And the truth is we have a slogan around here, better together, but we believe that when we're together, there's something powerful that takes place. And when you're leaning in and not away, you're gonna be less likely to fall asleep and to fall out the window. I don't know if you guys have ever fallen asleep before, uh, and I'm embarrassed to, to even share this story, um, but three weeks ago, I went to the movies, went back to the movies, and I, I had to go by myself because my wife hates the movies. I know, pray for her, pray for her. Um, but I went by myself, and it was just gonna be a relaxing time, and so the movie, though, was kind of quiet and like was slow moving, and Pastor Tom just, he nodded out like Marquise does. Like he just, he just went to sleep. And um, I remember this, and I, <laughs> I remember this. I wake up, and I could have swore the guy was standing there with an ax and a, and a hammer. And I went into full fight mode. Like, I thought I was being attacked. So I started kicking and punching. This guy fell in between the seats, and I quickly realized it was just an usher. He had a broom and the sweeper thing. He was just trying to wake me up. The lights were on and nobody else was there. And I thought to myself, all the people that were in this theater, they all walked out, they saw me asleep, and they didn't even care. It's so messed up. But back to love. Love, love says everyone needs someone. And I just can't help but to think that with God, we can't count anybody out. We can't count God out for sure. And I love this story because I believe today we need to know that God wants to use us to nudge those people around us. Because if we were to be real and honest today, some of us are asleep. And maybe some of us are just drifting through life. And then there's some of us that maybe, man, you're, you're battling an addiction that you just can't seem to kick. And there might be others of you that are sitting on the windowsill this morning and it's a dangerous place and you're flirting around with things you shouldn't be flirting around with. And maybe you're here today and you're entertaining thoughts of, of giving in or quitting and, and maybe you're here today and you're a successful businessman or businesswoman. I mean, you've done well at work, but you still doubt yourself. Whatever the case may be, I believe this, that it took some effort for you to get here today. That there are those in this room that might have got up this morning and you, th and you just said to yourself, I, I need to know that God loves me and he sees me. He hears me. And I'm here just to nudge you a little bit this morning. That God does see you, ma'am. God does see you, sir. He loves you. He has a plan for you. And he's making a way where there seems to be no way. God loves you. 
He adores us so much. The second thing the text tells us is Paul went down to Eutychus and he bending over him, he took him in his arms. The message version, I love this. It says Paul went down and he stretched himself on him and he hugged him hard and he said, no more crying. There's life in him yet. The Greek word there is uh, E-P-I-P-C-N. I'm only gonna say that once because that would, you don't say that 10 times fast. But the Greek word there literally means he threw himself on him. And in the text there, there is this, this idea that this implies a loss of dignity. Because, I mean, if we were, I mean, most dignified people don't hurl themselves on people, especially dead ones. Right? But this word, E-P-I-P-C-N, is only in the New Testament a couple times. And in fact, the one time that it is is in Acts chapter 10 when the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles for the first time. But the only other place that it has the same exact grammar as this place is in the story of the prodigal son. It's in that reunion of the father and the son that we see the same grammatical meaning. In chapter 15, verse 20, it says, So he, the younger son, set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off from his father, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And we know the son, right? The son was immediately like wanting to apologize and say what had happened. But I love the father's response. He quickly said, bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That's why we celebrate baptisms. Because when people go into that pool and they, the old life is gone and that new life comes, we cheer and we get excited because of what God has done in their life. But I love this, this passage because Luke evokes the memory in Acts 20 of Luke 15. It's Paul throwing himself on Eutychus is the same as the father throwing himself on the son. And what I love about this is in neither passage is there any lingering or question of fault or blame. Because honestly, we could assign blame to somebody. I mean, there's everybody in the, in the story, the father who gave, the son who squandered, Paul who preached, uh, Wendy preachers, right? Yudi who fell asleep and fell out the window. I mean, we could assign blame and parcel it out to everybody involved, but blame isn't the point. This is a story of God's great grace and love. And just as God, right, just as God throws himself on us in our lives, we have the opportunity then to throw ourselves into the lives of others. And I just believe through God's love and through his kindness, we can absolutely make a difference and change the world. Romans 2, 4 says in the message, I love this in the message, it says, God is kind, but he's not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us to radical life change. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm a sucker for heartfelt stories. Anybody else? Come on, I don't see too many guys as hands raised. Thank you right there uh, for being honest. But I love, I mean, I'm the, the guy like in a movie or a show that's like emotional, I'm crying. Like everybody's looking at me and uh, my son-in-law is the same way. Like we'll just be crying. We, don't, we can't watch million little things. Like it's just, we're done. Like we're a mess. But I've been following a guy, his name's Charlie. And uh, he actually goes by Charlie Rocket now. But he was a 29-year-old guy that was just, his life was going nowhere, and he decided he wanted to turn it around. And at the age of 29, he decided he was going to uh, become an Ironman, to become an athlete. So he lost 135 pounds and trained, and he ended up competing and winning an Ironman competition. And as a result of that, Charlie decided he, God had kind of put in his heart that he was going to travel the U.S., and make one million dreams come true. So he literally travels across the U.S. in his dream machine bus, making dreams come true. And about a couple months ago, he came upon a guy who was homeless on the streets in L.A. 
who was also an artist. And this homeless guy would do art, and he actually used M&Ms and uh, Skittles to, for color in that art, and he would try to sell it on the street. Well, Charlie decided he was going to take this guy and all of his art pieces and put on a huge art exhibit in L.A. And so they did it, and within four hours, they raised over $50,000 and was able to get this, young, this guy off the street and into a home. The power of kindness can change the world. But the reality is, in order for us to give love, we have to be able to receive love, right? And in order for us to give God's kind of love, we have to understand and be able to receive God's kind of love. So what is God's kind of love like? The same love that Paul had, the same love the Father had, and the same love that you and I can have today. Last week, Pastor Jordan encouraged us to listen. So I'm going to practice that with you guys right now. And I want you just to close your eyes. Just for a moment, I want to read this passage of Scripture over you today. And with your eyes closed, and if you feel comfortable, maybe just lift up your palms in your lap just to receive this. And I just want to declare and speak this over you because God's word, like I could literally stop preaching and just say God's word, and that is what changes lives. 1 John 4, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for you and me. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone, you and me, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will all have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, you and I are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. We love because he first loved us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. As we kind of wrap up this morning, I want to give you four things in this scripture that God's love is like. And the first thing is God's love is sacrificial. And not only is it sacrificial, but it's saving, it's secure, and it's sanctifying. God's love is sacrificial. I mean, God loves us so much that he held nothing back. He sacrificed it all for you and for me. The scripture says this is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. He gives the son to the world, to believers, non-believers, to everybody. And then what I love about this is he gives the spirit to the church. The spirit is what helps us be like him and love the world like he does. And I love that John says God is love, not love is God. Because I think our world sometimes gets it twisted around. 
Our world says, do what makes you feel good. That's love. And we sacrifice all moral principles in order to obtain such love. But that's not true love. God is love. God is holy. He's just. He's perfect. He's loving. And he sacrifices it all for you and for me. And so in turn, we sacrifice our lives. We give our time. We give our talent, our treasure, our touch. We, we give those things to give. We serve. We, we reach. We invite. We bless. We pray. We include. Because John says, in this world, we are like Jesus. And if we don't love like he does, how will the world ever know how loving and kind he really is? It's time for us as a church to get out of our seats and get out in those streets and make this city know that there is a God who loves them and is kind. Amen? The second thing is he's saving. I mean, God, I don't know about you, but I am so thankful God pursues us, recklessly comes after us because he loves us and he has a plan for us. And I love that we can never, listen, you are never too far from God. It is literally in one moment that we are back in right standing with God. When we acknowledge and believe who he is and what he wants to do in our life, it just takes a moment. And the, today, I believe that there are folks here today that you just need, you need that moment. You need to know that God loves you and he has a plan for you. He sent the Holy Spirit to be a helper, and we, just, we cannot count out anyone because God is involved. I love John 3.16 in the message. It says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why. So that no one would be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go through all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again, because anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. It's such good news. His love saves us from sin. And not only does it save us from sin, but it saves us from eternal damnation in hell. It gives us eternal life with him in paradise. His love saves us. His love drives out fear. I love that. His love is always pursuing us, never Never does it not pursue us. And I think as the church and as believers and as Christians, we can do the same as this passage said, and we can stop pointing the finger at the world, and we can begin to wave our hands, our outstretched hands, and say, come home, welcome home, come find love, come find rest, come find assurance, come find peace, come find healing, come find the love of Jesus. We can rely on God's love. It's secure. God will never stop loving you. For God to stop loving you would mean God would have to stop being God. God will never stop loving us. His love is secure. We can count on it. I love the passage in Romans chapter 8. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? Mm-mm. Shall hardship? No way. Persecution? Nope. Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? None of it. He said, and knowing all these things, we are more than a conqueror through Christ who loved us. And I, said, I love this verse. He says, for I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor debt, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. It's secure. It's always there. We can count on it. And then lastly, it's sanctifying. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. And so his love, man, it changes us from the inside out. And we know that it's a process, sanctifying process that God does for the rest of our life. But the true test of sanctification, honestly, from this scripture, if we say we love God, we can't say we love God unless we can testify to a change of your attitude towards people you once hated. Like that's a true test. Now, I grew up, my dad was a little hardcore, and I grew up loving the Michigan Wolverines. 
It was our team. My dad actually had two rules to live in his house. You had to hate the house, say, but guys, and you couldn't drive a foreign car. Like those were the two rules, but there was no red. Sorry, all of you people with red shirts, you would not be allowed at our house. We didn't allow red in our house. My dad wouldn't allow red cars to be parked in his driveway. He was hardcore, y'all. I grew up hating Ohio State, hating them. I mean, I still do a little bit. God's still sanctifying me. <laughs> but along the way, I've met some, some pretty nice Ohio State fans. We have an usher here. His name's Lynn, sitting right here on the front row. He actually played for Ohio State. And when I first met him, I didn't like him. <laughs> I just got to be honest. I thought he was a horrible usher. Horrible. <laughs> I'm like, who hired this guy to be an usher? But no, I, I found that Lynn is an amazing guy. I love him to death. And we're able to kid each other about Ohio State and uh, Michigan. And uh, he's just lucky because they've been winning a lot. But we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> I'm not counting God out. But seriously, God does something in us. And it changes us from the inside out. His love is sacrificial. It's It's saving. It's secure and it's sanctifying. And all we have to do, all we have to do is redirect our attention and our focus on the cross. The cross is a culmination of all those things. The finishing work of Christ on the cross and in his death and resurrection, it's in that. That's what changes everything. If we could just refocus and put our attention on the cross, I believe it will help us acknowledge our need for God's kind of love. And not only do we acknowledge God's need, our need for God's kind of love, but we need to believe that God wants to give us that kind of love. Can I nudge you this morning? You are worthy to be loved. You are worthy. God thought so highly of you that he sent his son Jesus to die for you because he loves you. He adores you. And you need to believe that God wants to give you that kind of love, that he would stretch himself out for you and me. And if we can acknowledge our need for God's love and we can believe that God wants to give us that kind of love, then I believe we can commit to showing others God's kind of love. But we can't do it in our own power. The scripture says it's not by power, it's not by might. We're not gonna strong arm anybody into this. It's gonna be by his spirit, says the Lord. And so this morning, I wanna teach you a little something. I've uh, became really close friends with a guy up in Charlotte, he's a pastor. And I, I just, uh, as soon as I met this guy, I just knew he was the real deal. He's actually pastoring one of the fastest growing churches in America right now. And they're doing it totally different than most churches do it. But he was teaching just uh, a couple months ago and he grew up and he was one of those kids that never fit in, had learning disabilities and got made fun of. And he just had a really tough childhood. And his dad, he remembered his dad used to teach him something to kind of get his attention and to snap him, snap him back into like, hey man, focus, focus. And he would get his hand up. And he would say, Andy, just look at my hand, look at my hand. He said, move your fingers, move your fingers. So come on, I want you to practice that this morning. Can you put your hand up? Kind of give your jazz fingers back at me there. You guys are looking good today. But he would get his attention. He says, Andy, I want you to remember this. Keep your hands up. He said, I want you to remember this. I, everybody say I, with your thumb, have Jesus for this. I have Jesus for this. You might be asking, Pastor Tom, what's this? This is everything that you're going to go through. This is everything you've gone through. This is that cancer diagnosis you just got. This is the kids that maybe walked away and haven't been home and walked away from the church and from God. This represents every trial and everything the enemy would try to do to come against you. 
I have Jesus for this. So here's what I want you to do. I want to pray that God would move on this. His presence has been in this room today. He's here right now. And I don't know what year this is, but I'm believing God wants to make a way where there seems to be no way. So would you go ahead and lift up your this? God, we pray right now in Jesus' name for healing, God. We pray for broken relationships to be restored right now. God, we pray for the hearts of fathers to turn back to their kids and kids' hearts to turn back to their fathers. God, we give you this. We give you our future. We give you our present. We give you our past. God, would you move on this? And thank you, God, for loving us so much that we can say, I have Jesus for this.